a grotesque green goo, squirting a vile primordial juice all over our river. This, this is not good. The green monster, it came from the river. My first question is, what is this? An alien creature invades a pristine environment. A cellular organism that's part animal, part plant. Sliming anything in its path. There's nothing to stop it. The river transmogrified. The townspeople mortified. They just had no clue. And the worst part. It can happen any summer. Is there an answer? Education is the answer. Can the town save its crown jewel? It's the heart of our city. Can the river beat the green monster? All bets are off. Don't touch that dial. The green monster, it came from the river. Coming, maybe, summer 2006. This time, it's personal. Something seems to be taking over the water. It is billions of algae particles do not come in contact with the river. weeks, the algae bloom has exploded. The river is tinged green. And right now, they don't seem to know why it's so bad this year. Because there are toxins or poisons. More bad news is to come. Bad news is to come. Bad news is to come. Sure, you remember last summer, from mid-July till mid-October, in one big gulp, the green monster swallowed the St. John's. It was like an alien invasion. But actually, it was an algae invasion. Algae. It was the biggest bloom in the history of the St. John's. The green was our red alert, a warning sign that our river is sick. Who did it? Why should we care? How can we fix it? One thing is certain, none of us, none of the nearly four million of us living in the St. John's watershed had ever seen anything quite like it before. Even the experts were stunned. To find this in our river? We've used it for years, and we didn't mean to, but we have used it for years. Dr. Quentin White is Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Jacksonville University. He's also a professor of biology and marine science, and for 30 years, a student of the river. What you end up with is ideal conditions for, in this case, a blue-green algae to bloom, to explode. It's a little bit like weeds taking over your yard. What happened last year was unprecedented. Neil Armingjohn is the official St. John's River Keeper. Maybe you've seen him on patrol, responding to citizen complaints and identifying pollution problems. Well, the river's sick. It's the river's way of telling us, I've got problems. We're at a critical juncture uh, in its history. City Hall in Jacksonville knew it had a problem. It wasn't easy trying to figure out this green new world. I recall being in my law office building some 15 stories up looking down on this river that was phosphorus green, and I, I didn't understand why. It was very disconcerting. And Mayor Payton, who grew up living by the river. My first question was, what is this? Uh, came into the office and we literally had a calling all cars meeting of you know every type of stakeholder uh, that has some form of responsibility or interest in our river to talk about the condition. The algae bloom taught us there's something terribly wrong. And if the pronouncements of PhDs and politicians aren't enough for you, here's Ben Williams. Ben runs a seafood market in Mandarin. What got him was the smell. He says it was like... Sewage? I don't know how else to describe it. It wasn't exactly sewage, but it was pretty darn close. This from a guy who works around dead fish all day. And it was like somebody had taken a thick pea green paint. I mean, just super thick, like almost a pudding. And just, it was crazy. Then there's Howard Solomon. This fun, isn't it, buddy? Howard takes kayak and canoe parties up and down the river. That's his business, group outings, and occasionally his dog. Good boy, uh-oh, uh-oh, don't fall in. But last summer, after a few minutes paddling around Mandarin Point, the party was clearly over. You were in this green, slimy, it's just like a layer of slimy, lime-colored paint. And you know, every stroke you took, you, you know, you were just, you were in it. The St. John's Water Management District checked things out. As for the bloom. It's the worst that I think that, that we've documented. An algal bloom is a symptom. It is a symptom of a river that needs help. So what the algal bloom told us was that our river needed some attention. So they tested the river some more, and what they found was kind of scary. The 
frightening thing, uh, it was toxic. Like near Jacksonville University, where the water was so toxic, it was 60 times the recommended limit of the World Health Organization. And in other places, it was even worse. 150 times what the World Health Organization considers safe. Really? Right. The results were so disturbing, Duval County's Health Department issued a warning in August, a health alert to the citizens of Duval, Clay, and St. John's counties. That was what they were advise advising, is that people should avoid direct contact with the river or a prolonged exposure to the river, like, for instance, standing on this dock here. In other words, stay away from the river, at least the part slimed by the algae. Otherwise, you could have respiratory problems or skin, eye, nose, or throat irritations. As for boating, swimming, skiing, or sea doing, better not. Children or pets playing along the shoreline, not advised. What about eating fish from the river? At the time it issued the warning, the health department said the risk was unclear. This is a body of water we cannot take for granted. We have to be responsible for it, and anything we need to do to make it better, to clean it, and to fix it, uh, we should do. And sometimes it takes an incident like that to really get everyone's attention. Well, that it got for a while, but attention alone won't keep the green away for good. At the outset of creation, when God formed the world and created the world as we know it, in the book of Genesis, he put Adam and Eve over the garden, and they were specifically instructed to dress and to keep the Garden of Eden, to manage the environment. I believe in a balanced approach, but I believe in the commandment that we are to be good stewards with what God has given to us. Now, you may be asking yourself, why care about any of this? After all, isn't your own life complicated enough? You've got a mortgage or rent, your car needs a new clutch, the kid has the flu, the neighbors are noisy, and the last time you checked, the job's not so great either. You've got a lot on your list, and little green algae probably doesn't make the top 40. So why care? Well, the bottom line on that is the bottom line. So put aside the fact that the river defines Northeast Florida. I always have identified our community with the river. I still call it the River City. Put aside the fact that the bloom could have been an ecological disaster. It could have been worse. I mean, in some of these blue-green events, uh, hundreds of thousands of fish die. I mean, literally, there's no oxygen in the water. Put aside the fact that this could happen again, and again, and again. It can happen any summer. Put all that aside, throw it away. Just remember the famous phrase, it's the economy, stupid. The economy, that's the real green monster. I think it could be a, a big economic monster, and I don't think people always understand that. But let's try. Back to Ben Williams. Last summer, his customers, as they looked over the fish, the shrimp, the clams, the oysters, they looked them over and some were afraid. They were worried about anything that might have come from the river. So worried that some of Ben's suppliers got hurt. Bad. Like Shelly Danforth, the crab lady. It crushed us last year, but you know we're hoping that everything goes well this year, and we hope that what, the green algae doesn't come back. For Shelly, the green monster was a real smackdown. Even though health officials eventually said the crabs were okay, hardly anybody wanted to buy her catch. They were just scared they were going to get sick. They didn't know of what type of sickness. They didn't know anything. They just they saw it on the news, and that's all they said. Well, we saw it on the news, so we don't want to eat. You know. How much did your sales decline? Oh, by about seventy-five percent. Really? Yeah, it cost us a lot. It cost a lot of money out of our pocket. Same thing with Howard Solomon, the kayak guy. The green monster took a bite out of his business as well. It just kind of ripped out half of our playbook. You know, we just couldn't do these trips for a while. It's the ripple effect. And if it ripples enough, it's an economic tsunami to the small business. A stinky green river year after year hits local fishermen, fish markets, seafood restaurants, hotels, motels, campsites, and the people who sell the boats, the jet skis, the fishing gear, and the list goes on and on. And that sort of gets to the heart of it. It's, it's not just a touchy-feely environmental issue. It's, it's an economic issue. And it's not just small business that'll take the hit. So could property values, yours. If every summer you knew the St. John's River was going to turn iridescent green and have that 
smell and cause you to cough, then maybe I don't want to buy that piece of property on the river. Or maybe you'd have trouble selling the property you've got, or you'd have to sell it for less than you want it. It would certainly impact it, and no one knows how much because it's, it's market-driven and it's in the eye of the beholder. But at the same time, it would certainly impact the property. And not just people living on the river. Everyone would get socked, even homes miles from the water, middle-class neighborhoods. It would be a tattoo that the First Coast would have. People would hear about that. And what it says to the public when you have something like that happen is you're not taking care of your resources. Those homes, no matter where they are, would feel the impact of that. See, that's the thing these days. Word gets out, and the movers and the shakers would be the first to know about the Green Coast. But it's a reflection of who we are, and when the river looks bad, we look bad as a city, particularly to those looking at our city as a place to grow or expand their business. A big corporation headquartered in here could mean millions to the Northeast Florida economy, but no company wants to move its employees to a dump we'd lose out to other cities that take better care of their resources. When we keep our river clean and we do the right things, the, the economic ramifications are that we attract more great companies to our city to create high wage jobs and raise our per capita income. We think back to Super Bowl, how all the activities were centered around the river. <laughs> Go Eats! In events like the Super Bowl, you really just get one shot. We would have lost that opportunity if our river had been in a bloom situation. From kayaks to boats to crabs to markets to neighborhoods miles from the river to 140 million TV viewers who watch a Super Bowl, the economy of Northeast Florida is inescapably tied to the river. That's why you should care. It would have been hard to obscure the green in the river if we had had a big event taking place at the same time. And fortunately, that hasn't happened, but we must ensure that it never will happen. To have another occurrence such as the green algae of last summer would certainly be a blot upon our reputation and image. So we've got a stake in the river, whether we are in it or on it, or whether we're miles away from it. So who done it? Who's responsible for the green monster? Well, it's you and me. It's all of us in Northeast Florida. Here's a short list. There's our industrial pollution, our agricultural pollution, our wastewater from septic tanks, and our wastewater from sewage treatment facilities, both privately owned and municipal, like the JEA. It treats most of Jacksonville's sewage. Now, we do a far better job treating pollution than we used to, no comparison. Why, years ago, believe it or not, Years ago, we used to dump raw sewage into the river. We don't do that anymore. Instead, we dump nutrients in the river. Way too many, apparently. The river has so many nutrients in it at this time, regardless last year or this year, that it is exceeding what the river can handle. The nutrients are exceeding what the river can handle and maintain its health. Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Adding it to the river is like putting the algae on steroids. It's easy to point to the big sources of pollution because they're easier to spot. And of course, one of them is JA. If you read the Florida Times Union, you know Ron Littlepage. His column appears there four times a week. Last summer, he called the river a sickening green mess. The cities would die to have this running through the middle of their downtown, and we have it. We just need to take advantage of it. But what I always like to remind people is that, you know, we are the JEA. It's treating our waste and we need to make the JEA do a better job of treating that waste. There are government agencies and advocacy groups whose mission is to monitor the big guys. Here's another short list. They certainly don't always agree all the time, maybe not even a lot of the time, but one thing everyone agrees on. It's gonna take a lot of money. It's gonna take a lot of cooperation. It's gonna take a lot of partners to restore this river. In the meantime, is there anything else that can be done? Something you can do now? Well, yeah. And you don't need to go any further than your own front yard. Start by looking at your fertilizer bag. See where it says nitrogen, phosphorus? You heard those words just a couple minutes ago. There are two of the nutrients produced by wastewater facilities when treating your sewage. It's the very stuff that helps the algae grow. 
the same phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium that you're reading on your fertilizer bags is going into the river and it's causing the same growth in the river that it did on your yard. But how does that happen? How does your fertilizer get to the river? Well, it takes the express route, the storm drain. Anything that falls on that yard or falls on the street or on that parking lot is going to be washed into the street, into a storm drain, eventually into the river. And that's anything. Oil drippings from your car, litter, pesticides and herbicides, long clippings, and fertilizer. It's called stormwater runoff. There's nothing to stop it. Uh, it's a straight shot. What's more, once in the drain, nothing magical happens. Unlike your sewage, what goes in your storm drain remains untreated, goes right to the river as is. Whatever we put into our storm drains ultimately makes its way untreated to the St. John's River. Now, if you want to get picky, yeah, retention ponds are in some newer neighborhoods, and that can help nitrogen and phosphorus settle out a little, but only a little, and ultimately the pond water goes to the river too. Now let's do some quick math. Suppose every homeowner sends a pound of fertilizer to the storm drain every year. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but there are 400,000 homes in Duval County alone. Just even an excess pound of fertilizer a year several hundred thousand pounds of excess fertilizer to run into the river. And maybe even that wouldn't be so bad, but we've been sending hundreds of thousands of pounds of lawn runoff to the river every year for decades. Some experts say we may be at capacity. It's not that 400,000 pounds is too much. It's the fact that that's on top of everything else we've been doing. It's like anything else. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, how much more can you put on something until finally it just collapses, it can't hold anymore. So should we stop using fertilizer, let our grass die, put down AstroTurf? <laughs> well, no. We're not asking people to go to great lengths and, and make radical changes. We're asking people to do things that we think are simple, easy, and cost effective. Actually may save you some, some money in the long run. And if everyone did that, when 3.6 million of us do something, it all begins to add up. I think we've got to understand that every individual makes a difference. And you can do it for yourself, but you can also do it for your children and for your grandchildren. So spend the next five minutes watching this program and you might save hours of yard work, get a healthier river, and still have a great lawn. It's something that God has given us that is free. I think the the plans and the developments around Jacksonville have come about because of our amenities like the river. Sometimes it's just awareness. Uh, we have a lot of golf courses here. Just the impact that our golf courses have on the environment. If we contacted them, I'm sure they would be good corporate citizens and would buy into it. Uh, and they buy fertilizer by the tons. Here are seven tips for a river-friendly yard. Just enough to get you started. Very simple, just the basics. Call it River Friendly Yard 101. If you're really into this and want more details, check out this website after the show. In the meantime, Jacksonville residents Bill and Annie Carrill have graciously allowed us to give their lawn a not-so-extreme makeover. First on the agenda, the fertilizer. Read before you feed. Some of these, the fertilizer products are not made specifically for Florida, they're made for other climates and they have completely different soil types than we do. So on the fertilizer bag, look for a series of three numbers. The first number is the nitrogen. The second number is the phosphorus. The third number is the potassium. The first and third number, the nitrogen and potassium, should be between 15 and 18. They should be equal or near equal. The second number, the phosphorus, should be no more than two, preferably zero. Florida soil already has plenty of phosphorus. You don't need more. The configuration to look for then is something like? Like a 16016 and 18018 would be perfect, but the important thing is just for the nitrogen and the potassium to be equal or near equal and the phosphorus to be no more than two. Then look for a phrase like this, somewhere on the back slow release.
It means that it's going to be available to the plant longer and it will be released in slow quantities. So it's kind of like a slow feeding for the grass, which is a good thing. Next, less is best. When fertilizing, don't overdo it. Too many nutrients actually hurt your yard and the excess goes in the river. Oh yes, most people have no clue how much fertilizer they're putting out and they want to, to have the, as green a grass as their neighbor does, so they're actually putting on a little bit more. They have that mentality, if a little bit works, more is better. So fertilize just twice a year, once in March, once in September, that's it. That's all you need in Florida. Watch where you're spreading the fertilizer. Don't scatter it on the street or driveway. Every bit of that goes to the river too. You want to keep everything on the lawn. Next, irrigate. Don't irritate. The watering is one of the biggest misuses that we probably have in the area. Seems like everyone waters way too much. All that does is send more fertilizer into the storm drain. It's not good for the yard either. Overwatering weakens your root system and makes the grass less resistant to drought and disease. It's also a waste of water, especially when you put your sprinklers in the wrong place and you wind up watering the driveway. So water early in the morning when the temperature and winds are at their lowest. You'll have less evaporation. In summer, water no more than twice a week. Spring and fall, once a week. Winter, every 10 to 14 days. The amount to water each time? Three quarters of an inch, each watering. Three quarters of an inch, that's all. This is just a tuna can. It's a straight-sided can. It's flat bottom. You can put out several of these in a particular zone, run the system for a known period of time, and then you can measure the amount of water. Mark off the can at quarter-inch increments, and then you can go out and inspect and say, OK, there's 3 quarters of an inch. By the way, that 3 quarters of an inch includes rain. Many times we are getting sufficient rainfall. We're getting 3 quarters of an inch a couple of times during the the week during the growing season. In that case, you shouldn't have to irrigate your lawn at all. Next, downsize the pesticide. In other words, spot treat. Your exposure is limited. That's not a bad idea. And the less you spray, the less that goes into the river. Treat when you see a problem and just treat the affected plants and maybe a small buffer area to prevent the spread of that particular problem. Next, mow to grow. Mow high. Keep it three inches high, at least. Only remove one third of the top at each mowing. Keep your blades sharp. Don't blow grass clippings in the street. They'll go into the storm drain. Instead, leave them on the lawn. Believe it or not, it actually benefits the, your grass because it breaks down and it creates fertilizer for your grass and increases the organic matter. Next, have bed, we'll buffer. Take two corners, I'll take two corners, ready? Yes, ma'am use plants next to the streets, driveways, sidewalks, and water bodies. That keeps nutrients in your yard and out of the river. It'll reduce the size of your lawn too. That's less for you to maintain. Remember, right plant, right place. Go for low maintenance plants that don't need a lot of fertilizer, pesticides, or water. Then use an organic mulch. Leaves, wood chips, pine bark, pine needles. Those are great mulches that'll slow runoff. Avoid cypress mulch. Finally, do the lawn care company quiz. If someone besides you does your lawn maintenance, find out if they're river friendly. On this website are the questions you need to ask them. In fact, this is the place to go after the show. It's loaded with details that'll help you create a river friendly yard. You really might say that the river, the St. John's River, is the soul of our city. It is a constant in all of our lives. Even though it has certainly served us well over the years, it's time now that we serve it. And I think when our big, beautiful river turned into our big green river this last year, it was a, it was a loud wake up call. Once everyone understands, I feel sure they'll want to take care of our treasure. Suppose we just let it go. Don't do anything. Don't even try. Let the river turn green year after year. We can ignore this, put our head in the sand and say, well, you know, the river's going to handle it. We're beyond that. Folks, what used to be is no longer 
you know, air, all bets are off. You know, we have to take steps uh, some of us could have never imagined 20 years ago to protect the health of the St. Johns River. We've been discovered. People want to be near something that's beautiful. They want to experience it. And that's the real challenge for all of us. The best cost-effective way to, quote, remove those pollutants is to try to keep them from going in in the first place. Look, you know, if something happens to the river, all of this is very fragile and, and we could lose it. There is an effort right now to understand what we call the, the TMDL, the total maximum daily load. And the reality is we don't know what that number is. We simply don't know what the river can handle. And it's such a huge system that when you start doing the math, the numbers get so big that it's almost incomprehensible. That's part of the problem. There's so much about the river that we don't know. We just don't know. But worst case scenario. Well, I think what it involves into is the river being dead. We have seen so much growth and so much runoff over the last 200 years. This is not something that's come up quickly. The river is finally reaching its capacity to take in the excess nutrients and runoff and things that we're putting into it. It's that cumulative impact that gets you. It was death by a thousand cuts. We've been given our warning. Nature uh, warns us when we're not treating her properly. And I think we, uh, you know, we view what happened last summer as our wake-up call. And if we continue to ignore the river, if we continue to ignore our responsibility to protecting the river, then I think the river itself has already given us the script. But that's a script for a horror movie, kind of like what you saw at the beginning of our program. Is that a sneak preview of our future, our coming attractions? Because if it is, that means it's our river saying, that's a wrap. I don't want a ticket for that. But we're leaving you now, so from here on out, it's up to you to finish the script. Me? I like happy endings. How about you? <laughs>